So my name's Mike, and if we haven't met, I would love to meet you. If you're new here at the church, come up here, say hi to me. I'd love to shake your hand, answer any questions that you have. And as Pastor said, we're continuing in our book of James, and we find ourselves in the last part of James 2 this week, in verses 14 through 26. Before I dig into these verses, before we dig into this, some, some stuff, you know I'm going to do some teaching today as well, because we've got to set the stage of these verses so you have an understanding. So I want to ask you, do you believe every word in this is true? Yes. Do you believe every word is true? Yes. Do you believe it works in your life yes. if you apply it, yes. right? If you apply it. Do you think there's any contradictions in this word? There are none in this word, right? I want you to remember that as we get into these set of verses. Because James 2, 14 through 26, people will like to take and say there's some contradictions in these things. And this is where the teaching is going to come in. Because I need, I need you to get this and understand this before we get in and read these scriptures. You've got to grasp what's going on here. People will say... James and Paul are against each other when you look at these scriptures. They're not. What did, I, what did we just say? There's no contradictions and every word is true, right? Amen. All right, so let's start in Ephesians real quick. This is what Paul wrote. This is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Is that true? 100% true. We've said it, right? James 2, verse 14. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Is that true? Is there a contradiction? No, you guys are real quiet now. Those no's and yeses are getting real quiet right now. There's no contradiction. There's no nothing in it. You've got to understand what they're talking about. You've got to understand what the books are about. What did I tell you? James is a book about your sanctification. It's about your works that you're called to do after you've put your faith, hope, and trust into Jesus, right? Paul is talking about the two verses that I read are talking about your salvation. It is by faith alone and there's nothing you can do. You see, what happens is because the word is true and every part of it's true, people will take these verses out of context and use them for whatever they want to use them for. And that's where we get this hyper grace this grace card, this I'm going to do whatever I want to do because Jesus loves me and there's nothing that can happen, right? There's no works I got to do. I just got to say I believe in Jesus and everything's good to go. And all you do is you tow this sin line and you don't try and get far, far away from it. You're just like, ah, I come here on Sunday and Sunday night I go to the club. Right? It's because you've got this grace card in your pocket and you go, look it, there's nothing I have to do. It's all by faith alone. And then you get the other camp that takes James and they're like, it's works. It's all about works. And it's like, I got to read. I got to study. I've got to go to church. I've got to pray. I've got to do all these things. And that's mind numbing. That's mind numbing. You see, it truly is nothing that you can do. There's no works that can lead you to salvation, which let me tell you, side note, if there's nothing that can save you, no works, that means there's no works that you're going to do that's going to lose your salvation. Amen. However, what you can do, because it's a gift, you can take any gift you give and put it on a shelf and just let it sit there and not do anything with it. The problem is we don't read things in context, we don't keep reading, we don't take all the verses, we don't listen to what they're talking about, Right? Just read one more verse in Ephesians. Ephesians 2.10. Let's just read 9 and 10. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You see, Paul understands there's works that need to be had, which is the works that James is talking about that you need to have. The problem is you got to get them in the right order. They're talking about this true faith, this faith that leads to works, right? Which leads me to the justification aspect, which is the second part in these scriptures that we see that always gets debated. Paul talks about justification by faith. James talks about justification by works. Which one is it, right? In Romans, in Romans 5, Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we celebrate in hope of the glory to God, which sounds just like Ephesians we talked about. Justification by faith. James, in 2.24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Once again, which one is this? Is it faith? Is it works? Is it both? It's both aspects that we have to see. The problem is, once again, don't take scripture and read a certain thing and don't read the rest of it. Read all of what the author talks about. Paul says in Romans 3, 28, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So what you're talking about is justification before God. And the only way to do that is to surrender your life and have faith in Jesus. That he died on the cross, that he rose on the third day, that he is your hope. That's the justification before God. James is talking about the justification before man. How do I see if you truly believe in Jesus? It's easy to talk. It's easy to say I'm a Christian. The words can come out of your mouth just fine. What's the byproduct? What's the fruit that I see from it, right? Let me give you an example of this. Let me give you an example of what we're talking about. In the book of Mark, this is Jesus talking in here. And this is, I just got to teach this story in kids too, which is awesome. So in, in Mark 2, this is when you've got four friends bringing a paralyzed man to Jesus, right? And they're trying to get to him, but the crowds are all around and they can't get to him. So they're trying to push through. They've got to climb some stairs because if you remember the story, they lowered him through the roof. They didn't have elevators then, <laughs> Right? So they're climbing these stairs, carrying this guy, right, up these stairs to lower him down in front of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus says. Verse 5. And Jesus seen their faith. Now, Jesus is fully God and fully man. You see justification before God by faith. And you see justification before man by works right there in that statement alone. Jesus seeing their faith. So he sees their heart. He sees the faith that they have, that they believe in the Son of Man. They believe that he can heal. And he sees it by the actions of carrying this man up the stairs to lower him down in front of him. And what's he say? Son, your sins are forgiven. And now the Pharisees, they're, they're all up in an uproar, right? Because he's forgiving sins, right? So he, they're in an uproar. And Jesus knows it. Once again, fully God can see their heart, can see their thoughts. What's he say? Verse 8. Why are you thinking about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. So Jesus had the authority. He had every authority to say, your sins are forgiven. Right? But what's easier to say, right? 
I'm a Christian? Or have your works show it, right? What's easier to say, your sins are forgiven, where nobody can see that aspect, or to pick up your pallet and get up and go? There's a works that's based off from it as well, right? As you read in James 2 later on, it talks about Abraham's story, it talks about Rahab, and it talks about how Abraham was justified because of the offering that he was going to do for Isaac, right? It talks about Rahab, how she was justified because she hid the spies. It's this works that comes after your salvation, after you believe. You see, James quotes Genesis 15, where it says that Abraham believed and it was counted righteous to him. And that's the same thing that Mark does as well. Or uh, what Paul quotes as well in Romans. They quote the same verse. Which, by the way, Genesis 15 comes before 22. So James and Paul are both talking about the same faith that you need, right? No works, no nothing of the law that you can do. But then there's a works that comes afterwards. This true works, this true faith that leads to works. That's why this message I entitled, Faith Leads to Works. Because it does. It has to. There's this byproduct. That works is the byproduct of it. It's what proves you have faith in Jesus. Right? We, we have these talks all the time. And I know a pastor said, don't debate. It's not worth it. And I agree. I used to love to debate, but it's useless now. Titus tells us, forget about debates, man. It's useless. Don't worry about them. This is why you got to understand what we're talking about when we get into these verses. And what truly is the sign that someone has Jesus and the Holy Spirit working in their lives. Some people will go to the stream to say, man, the evidence is that you speak in tongues. I'll tell you that's not what we believe. It is a sign. I'm going to show you what I believe. What I believe scripture clearly states is evidence that the Holy Spirit's working in your life. Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit. Are you walking by the fruit of flesh or the fruit of the spirit? Remember, the fruit of the spirit, as pastor always says, they're in order. And love is the very first thing that's there. So I would argue the evidence is love. And why do I say that? Because in 1 Corinthians, Paul's literally having this debate with the church. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. Give me a second. 1 Corinthians 13. This is in between the two chapters. He's talking about gifts. He says, if I speak with the tongues of mankind and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions to charity, and if I surrender my body so that I may glory, but do not have love, it does no good. He's literally telling you what it is, is love. You should be able to see the fruits of the spirit in love. And I'm not talking about just a love that just accepts, love that calls out things that need called out. Love that is in a loving way. Love that is the woman at the well love. Where Jesus meets her where she's at, calls her out in a very strong way, and that woman's life is changed and transformed, and so is the region. That's the love. It's the love that you find in 1 John. Sorry, I'm all over the place. It's the Holy Spirit. 1 John 3.16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. But whoever has worldly goods, sees his brother or sister in need, closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? 1 John 4.20. If someone says, I love God, yet he hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother and sister whom he has seen cannot love God, God whom he has not seen. It's this Faith, this works that comes from a heart of love. You're moved to just love people, right? All right, 
so now that that's about a 15 minute intro. <laughs> James 2, 14. I'm going to read some here. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing, in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith, but I have works. Show me your faith without the works, I'll show you my faith by my works. Amen. You believe that God is one, you do well, the demons also believe and shudder. But you are willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. It's not merely just believing, it's trusting in the Lord. It's making him Lord of your life. This faith that leads you to when someone needs something, you just do it. You just do it. You see in Matthew, this is what we see in Matthew. Matthew 25, this is the end. This is the end of the days. This is when Jesus is separating the sheep and the goats. In verse 33, it says, he'll put the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you? Thirsty, give you something to drink. When do we see you as a stranger, invite you in, or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer to you, Answer to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. Amen. And then he goes on to say some of the scariest stuff where he says, you, you didn't feed me. You didn't give me a drink. You didn't provide me clothes. You didn't come visit me. And I'm not talking about the one time that you didn't do that, right? This is a lifetime of not doing this. And he says, depart from me. Right? He says, you're going to be in eternal damnation. This is what we're talking about. This is this true love that we see. You see, when Jesus says, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. They didn't even know they were doing it. It's Hebrews 13. Be careful. You might be entertaining angels. That's what this is talking about. I'll tell you a story. I was in Walmart. We, it's great that you just talked about Thanksgiving baskets too. This is funny. I was, we were filling up the carts. Rach and I were in Walmart filling up the cart to get Thanksgiving pack out baskets for people. And a lady came up and said, hey, you must be having a pretty big Thanksgiving. And I was like, no, we're actually filling baskets for the church. And she's like, oh man, it's, it's been a really rough year. I could really use the help with that, right? I thought I was doing a great thing. I'm like, yeah. Come to the church on this day, we'll get you a basket. I'm at the Middleburg, Wal Middleburg Walmart, about seven miles away. If this lady's struggling, it's going to be a struggle to get to Journey Church, right? But I'm just like, yeah, come, we'll get you a basket. Have a, it'll, be, it'll be great. I'm telling you, 30 seconds later, it's like, what are you doing? Why did you just invite her there? Just buy the basket for her. When I tell you the Lord's worked on me in this, right? This was years ago that he worked on me with faith without works is dead. I get that concept now. I don't pray for people anymore. I will look at them and say, I'm not praying for you. And they'll go, what are you talking about? I'm like, let's just go get what you need. I'm not trying to build myself up here. It's what we're called to do. If you have the ability or you know someone that has the ability to do it, just do it. Why waste God's time on a prayer that you can just take care of? 
That's what James is talking about. If you have the ability and all you do is, well, I pray that you get that tire fixed. I pray that you get clothes. I pray that you get this or food or that. And you can just do it, do it. Take care of it. And what's funny is these tests will come up to you, right? It just happened this week again as I'm preparing for this. Somebody comes in that I know. I've talked to them before. I just need to get some clothes. I'm like, I got it, Lord. Let's go, right? Am I going to preach about it or am I going to do it as well, right? That's what we're called to do. It's this love that leads to a change, to a transformation, that you're no longer just sitting on the sidelines. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. It's what Pastor Adam talked about. Don't sit on the sidelines anymore. I'm s- I get it that there's a time, there's a season, and I'm going to be very careful with this, but I'm also tired of hearing it's not my season. We are called to serve one another. Amen. We are called to serve. Jesus came to serve and give his life as a ransom. And I get there's times. I had a time too. I was laying in the hospital bed. But even laying in the hospital bed, I was programming lights on the computer. Right? There's always a time to serve in some way. Serving the people in the hospital. Ministering to them in the hospital. To those that are hurting. Whatever that case is, don't just be a spectator. My daughter uh, preached on serving back in the youth. And she talked about serving. And she used the analogy of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea just gets poured into, poured into, poured into, and nothing's coming out of it, and it's just dying, right? It's the same aspect. If you look in the Garden of Eden, God's presence came in through a river and went out into four rivers. Our thing here is you got to give the encounters away. Take your personal encounters and give them away. That's what we're called to do. Give them away. Serve this lost and hurting world out there. What's interesting is, In the garden, you see it come out in fours, and then the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 1, and it says to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. There's four again, right? The Holy Spirit's got to come in and go out. You can't just receive, 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 right? You can't just take, 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 take without giving as well. I always use a bank account analogy. If you just take from your bank, it's going to run dry. If you don't start depositing stuff, Right? It's going to run dry. These surf, the surf fair that's going on, this is one way to do it, right? The works, the byproducts of your faith, this is where it starts. This is where it starts at. I encourage each and every one of you that's not on a serve team, get into a serve team, right? Sit one, serve one, we like to say. Each and every one of you has a gift. You each have a unique gift that this body needs. This body needs your gift. You may not think it does. You may be like, ah, I don't have nothing to offer. You do. You do. Ask the Lord what that is. Find the spot to serve. Quick story. I know when I came here, I wasn't saved. This was like almost 18 years ago. I came here because my wife and kids were coming, right? So I, I needed to spend time with them. I wasn't seeing them. I was on a golf course. And I thought I could hide out in the booth. (laughs) <laughs> I could hide out in the booth and just hang back there and do some electronic stuff and change some lights and do some stuff. But truly, I had nothing else but to listen to what the pastor was saying, right? And to listen what, and get plugged in with other believers that were then sewing into me, right? That were bringing me along, which then led me to Christ through that process. So you may be sitting here going, I don't even know if I believe in Jesus. Serve. You'll believe. He won't leave you the way that you are. He will change and transform you if you allow him to. So truly, get to one of these serve teams, plug into one of these serve teams, and live on mission. Amen? Amen. That's what we're called to do. So I got totally off track. So in Matthew 25, we see him talking about the separation of the sheep and the goats, about how if you love, you're going to feed, you're going to do all these things, right? Right? It's about truly making him Lord of your life. That's what we're called to do. Because in Matthew 7, these are the scariest verses 
in all of scripture. I'm telling you right now. In Matthew 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? In your name cast out demons? In your name perform miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me who practice lawlessness. That should scare you. We just talked about it. I just told you about Matthew 25. Who's entering the kingdom? Who's not entering the kingdom? It's not about how many demons you cast out. It's not about how many prophecies you do. It's not about how many people you help. James, or uh, Paul says it in 1 Corinthians. If you do all of it without love, you're a noisy, ganging symbol. It's useless. It's all about when someone needs help, you're there, you help them. It's the works that come after the salvation. Amen? Amen. And what that is, is not the works of the enemy. Right? Ephesians 4.29 tells us to use words to build up, not to tear down. You're speaking life to each other. Amen. That's an example of love. It's not gossip. It's not spreading false things. It's building each other up. It's the woman at the well. It's changing her life, meeting with her where, that, where she's at. Amen? You have no idea who you're going to run into on the streets. You have no idea who's put in your path. And they're there for a reason for you to change and transform them, not because of you, but because of the power of the living God that lives inside of you. Amen? Amen? Amen. So as we close, would you rise to your feet? There's a couple people I want to pray for before we close. You might be sitting in here and you might fall into the category of where you just sat back on your faith and you just sat back and you're like, I believe in Jesus. I give him everything. But you haven't really done anything. There's no true fruit from what you've done. The enemy has a hold of you and doesn't want you to do what it is that you're called to do. He doesn't want you to use the gift that you have inside of you. Or you may not even know that gift that's in you. As the prayer team comes forward, I encourage you to come to the front and lay that down. Lay down that, that aspect of, you know, I, I've got my faith. I'm just going to sit here and receive and not actually pour out and serve. Or there's a group of you in here that thinks this is works based mentality and you're like, I've got this struggle going on in my life and I'm doing all these things. I'm doing all this stuff that you're telling me to do. Whether it be marital issues or healing that you're looking for or whatever it is, you're like, I'm doing all these things. I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do. But you're basing it off from a heart posture that the works are going to deliver and set you free that the works are going to heal you, that the works are going to save you, I want you to come to the front and just surrender. Just surrender all of that. Get rid of everything. Forgiveness is the one that's going to hold you back the most. Surrender that. I just heard forgiveness right now. Like, surrender forgiveness. If there's this unforgiveness in your life, it's going to hinder your walk. Surrender that. If you're in here and, I'm, and you're like, I don't believe in Jesus, but I want to know more. I want to know what these next steps are. I want to give my life to him. I want you to come to the front for that. So as every head's bowed right now, if you're one of those people that you just need to surrender everything. Stop fighting 